Welcome to the Mick, a Mick, and a Mike. Hosted by four-time Emmy-nominated producer Frank Bates and retired New York City firefighter, 9-11 first responder, and Vietnam vet Billy O'Connor. Today's guest, actor, director, and star in the iconic role of Bubba in the iconic film Forrest Gump, Michael T. Williamson. My brother. My brother. Where's Where's Billy? Derek? Didn't make it. Didn't make it. Didn't make it. No, no, no. He's 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 subject to one of the natural disasters of Los Angeles, stuck on the five freeway in a sig alert. Are we sure? Uh, well, we hope so. And <laughs> <laughs> we hope. Uh, every morning I wake up <laughs> <laughs> and, and wonder. <laughs> So, uh, so he'll he'll join us at some point in this podcast. He'll probably interrupt Michael T. Uh, our guest today is actor director Michael T. Williamson, best known for his role as Bubba in Forrest Gump, but he's been in so many other things: Justified, uh, Fences with Denzel. Uh, he's going to be a fascinating uh, guest for us. So, Derek, what, what's on your mind today? What's on my <laughs> mind? Oh boy. <laughs> Uh, there's no, there's no Billy to start us off with a, a, a story about a cat. You know, a, actually, a litter box. Uh, while we were on break, Billy and I hung out, and uh, it was lovely to see his um, his love fest with his wife. Surprisingly, they they were like uh, they were like teenage kids holding hands, really? uh, kissing each other. You know, from time to time. He's going to ruin it for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, I got to tell you, I was, uh, you know, feeling a little bit like, uh, hey, we need to step it up over here. Yeah, we need to step it up. Well, he's 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 only five years into his marriage. Oh, yeah, that's true. This is his third one, right? Second one. Second one, well, third one? It's Well, technically, it's his third marriage. So, because he's married the same woman twice. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. We don't get the privilege. He announced that I'm a recycler, right? When he, <laughs> when, when he remarried. Oh, my God. Do, do people even know what the recycler is? I don't know about it anymore, but do people know what... I mean, probably our, our audience probably knows. Well, our audience probably knows, but... Uh, who, I mean, does, does the younger generation even know who Harry Truman was? No. But you know what? I have a question about the recycler. Okay. So... You're, you've been in the industry for a long time. Right? right. Did you ever source any jobs from like Backstage West? I think it was called Backstage East or... or well, Backstage? Yeah. Uh, I often looked for jobs in okay. Backstage, uh, but I never really looked for employees out of Backstage. But really Backstage was more for auditions. People, actors who were seeking auditions because... Uh, Backstage often advertised where auditions would be and who would be doing them. Okay. So that's why probably you are fam about familiar right? with backstage because when you were a handsome young actor in your mid 20s, you probably looked at backstage. I did. I did. So did you ever put in the ads? Did you ever put in the ads in backstage? No. No. So you never worked on anything small as, as small as uh, would go in the back of. Uh, such pub, sub, such type of publication. When I was starting out, I worked on the smallest stuff possible. I mean, I got my director's guild card uh, by saying I was directing a commercial in in the Adirondacks or someplace that was so <laughs> <laughs> so bizarre <laughs> that they would never check right. on me, and then I paid my union benefits. Yeah, actually, that's a good question. So, so if you were to speculate in terms of percentages of people that started out their careers in the industry. How many of them in total, and, and I'm talking about like the, the, the full population of, of the industry, let's say from, from the time that you started, which was what, what year? 83. Okay, so 83. My, fir my first job actually in show business was Bay City Blues, which coincidentally starred our guest today, Michael T. Williamson. That is strange. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, well, I don't want to mess up that transition. Um, so should we bring him in? No, no, you just got okay. Well, I have a question. So how many how many people do you think from eighty? Let's just say nineteen eighty. Let, let's say nineteen seventy five to ninety five fabricate fabricated their uh, resume. 
and and went on to be successful. Well, I wouldn't want to speculate on that, but I would imagine it's pretty high. I know Jay Thomas, uh, my friend Jay Thomas, when he was trying to break in, said he was a graduate of Yale Drama School <laughs> <laughs> on his resume. And he was a graduate of Jacksonville University <laughs> in Florida. Uh, and he was at Yale one day, and he, he, he saw, the reason he found out that they knew is they had a picture of him up on the board as a graduate of the Yale Drama School. Whoa, yeah. really? A funny story, yeah. That is a funny So at Yale? At Yale. They didn't even check. They just took his word for it, and they put him on the board as a graduate of Yale Drama School. Wow. So do you think that the talent that exists now, because it's sort of being vetted by by real experience and, and uh, real you know legitimate backgrounds, do you think that limited the talent has gotten better or, or, or was there I, I the think ability it, to lie? You, you know what I mean? I think the greatest actor who ever acted has never been seen. The greatest writer who ever writ anything has never been read. Uh, the, the greatest director who ever directed has never been seen. His work has never been seen. I think there's so much talent out there that doesn't get a chance that I think you do anything possible to make a break for yourself. And again, uh, we'll talk to Michael T about that because he, he, he made his own break on Forrest Gump. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, Frank Pace for president 2024. <laughs> yeah. I'm too young. <laughs> Hilarious. I'm too young. Well, let's bring uh Okay, D Derek, can you bring on my friend Michael T. Williamson? Let's do it. Let's hey, do it. T., how are you? Great. How you doing? Good. So good to see you, Frank. I want to apologize because uh, our my other partner, Billy O'Connor, is not here. He's stuck in the five in a SIG alert. So he'll be joining us in progress. But you'll know when he's here because there'll be a whole cacophony of noise. That's for sure. <laughs> okay. All right. That's cool. How you been? I've been really well, really busy, and uh, trying to get a little R and R time. Just came off a movie I'm really passionate about uh, called The Last Rodeo, you know, and um, uh, just excited about about uh, about the future. Just brought a new team member on yesterday, so uh, on the management side, just for the acting, but on the directing side, I don't really have any representation other than an attorney, and I kind of like it like that. Yep. Why don't you tell us about the movie? Uh, the Last Rodeo is an Angel Studios project. It's uh, uh, written by uh, Derek Priestley and uh, my dear friend Neil McDonough, directed by John Abnett. So, uh, you know, fried green tomatoes and uh, a bunch of other things are, are, are what uh, John Abnett is known for. And uh, it's about a, Neil McDonough's character is the first lead, I'm second lead, his best buddy. Um, uh, it's a father-daughter story, and it's also uh, a road movie, a buddy road movie. It's about an, uh, a retired bullfighter in his 50s whose grandson needs an operation, and he calls his old friend up, uh, who's a retired bullfighter, bull rider himself. That would be my character. And he tells him the only way he can get this money is to go ride again at 50-something years of age, right. to go ride another bull for the championship. So it's uh, the buddies that go on the movie uh, with a fractured relationship and have to figure out how to compete in this rodeo at 50 something years of age. Wow. So it's a real good, real good story, man. Really. Uh, it's the kind of movie you can take your family to see. I think the most profane word is ASS. Uh, the grandson says to his grandfather, he uses the term. And his grandfather said, where you get that language from? He said, from you. So now <laughs> his grandfather's got to clean up his act, you know, and uh, and try to be more representative of what a positive image is for his grandson. But he's also got to try to save his grandson's life by risking his own. So it's a really, really good story. Great. You know? Great. How's my friend Neil? Neil is awesome. He's awesome, man. He's he's really awesome. Sarah Jones plays his daughter. She's fantastic because that relationship is fractured as well, you know. And he's trying to put his life back together and save his grandson's life. So it's quite a journey. 
Well, you and Neil have both played uh, baseball icons. I cast Neil as Lou Gehrig in my Babe Ruth movie, and yeah. you, you played Josh Gibson in uh, in, in a film Soul of the Game. Soul of the Game. Right. Why don't you tell us about that? Uh, for me, as a kid, I played baseball. And I remember you and I met on a project in 19, called Base City Blues, right? In 1983, which was the first project I ever worked on. Right. Well, you well, you were our technical advisor, producer, and you actually helped me tighten up my game because my game was nowhere near representative of a minor league player, you know. But you guys showed me a little grace. You believed in me, and you gave me that, helped me get through the gate with Stephen Bochco. And... Um, and then uh, flash forward, I ended up with Delroy Lindo and Josh Gibson on an HBO project called Soul of the Game. And it was an absolute honor to uh, represent a man like Josh Gibson, you know, because you see what's happening right now with the uh, incorporation, the incorporation right. into the baseball record books. Yep. Josh is uh, right. Because of yes. Right. Baseball is baseball. You know what I mean? Yep. So uh, but yeah, but it's um, but that was a, a very challenging for me because uh, there's one pivotal scene in Soul of the Game where Josh Gibson is on the rooftop screaming at the top of his lungs, out of his mind, and people thought he was just drunk and, 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 and totally naked and just out of control. But in fact, they later learned that it was a brain tumor mm -hmm. that he had, which would cause the severe sweating and the hallucinations and all of that stuff. And so um, to represent Josh Gibson with some dignity, it was it, an absolute privilege, man. It really was. What did you learn about Josh that you hadn't known before? Probably a lot of things. Well, but Yeah, a lot of things. Um, I, I didn't realize that he uh, switched up on a pitch and ended up hitting a home run single-handed. He went from a two-hand swing and he's was going to change up and he decided to go ahead and finish and he swung with one hand and knocked the ball over the fence, out of the park, across the street from the ball stadium. Wow. And I'm like, wow, what a powerful, powerful person you have to be to pull that off, you know? Well, you're, so, uh, you're, yeah. you're physically pretty big. You're about 6'2", 6'3", 6'2". Yeah, right at 6'3". Right yeah. and, yeah. and how big was Josh? You're probably comparable in size. Yeah, well, Josh was probably, he was probably 25 pounds thicker but more muscle right you know 20 pounds thicker but uh man what a tank of a human being you know wow so why don't you tell us a little about how you got forrest gump oh interesting story um i uh two of my students came in to audition uh, to coach with me to audition for forrest gump so i read the sides that they had and I ended up getting the book. A girlfriend at the time got me the book. And uh, and so when the two actors came, I tried to help guide them with the Bubba Blue character. But they didn't like what I was showing them. And so I said, okay, let's do what you're happy doing. And I helped them shape a performance that they were very confident in. And off they went. Neither got a call back. So I called them up and I said, hey, would you guys be okay if I went in on this project? I mean, I hadn't heard of it, but um, I think it's interesting. I'd like to go in. They were like, sure. Yeah, we didn't get a call back. Go. So I called my agent at the time, uh, uh, a gentleman who's no longer uh, uh, around, and I told him I wanted to go in. So he calls casting and they call, they, they call back and say that we spoke with casting. They say they don't, they don't know you. So I was like, they just saw two scrubs. I'm trying to help. What are you talking about? They don't know this, right? So, so it, it really rubbed me the wrong way. So I called the New York office, and I, I talked to uh, the head of the New York office, and I told him, I said, listen, uh, if I don't get in on this Forrest Gump movie, I'm going to leave the agency. This is ridiculous. Here's why. And I told him about the two scrubs that didn't listen and da, 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 da. So I get another call from an agent who's there who I'd come over to the agency with. Her name is Nina Pakula. And so Nina called me with a side phone call and she said, they just got you in 
on Saturday to audition for Forrest Gump. And they're not taking you seriously, Michael T. She said, when you go in there, I want you to kill them. It pisses me off that they're not taking you seriously. And they're just doing it to appease you so you won't leave the agency. So Saturday morning, I get up, drive out to Warner Brothers. Nobody's around except the janitors and security. Security lets me in. And the casting assistant takes me in the office, and I read the scene. Wow. And and she looked at me. She said, what's your name again? And I well, told by, her. By the way, you had an incredible list of credits at that time. So yeah. the fact that they yeah. didn't know you is crazy. But continue yeah. the story. It, yeah, but it rubbed me the wrong way. So that's why I made the phone call to, uh, to New York. But um, so... She asked my name. I told her how to say my name. And she said, can I put you on tape? I said, sure. So the janitor let us in another office down the hall <laughs> that, had, that had a camera. And she put me on top of someone else's videotape. The woman on the phone she called that let us use her office told her which tape to get. And she put me on that VHS tape and sent it off to Bob Zemeckis. How do you, like, you like to be the guy who taped over? <laughs> right, right. So, so, so Bob, Bob Z, I, I didn't know Bob Zemeckis, but he matched Tom Hanks and I up. And so he brought me in to match up with Tommy Hanks, and we're sitting across the table. And I knew Rita, but I had not known Tom Hanks very well. I'd only met him through Rita. Rita Wilson is his wife, Tom Hanks' right, wife. Right, right, Rita Wilson, yeah. And so when I finished the scene, Hanks is kicking me under the table because he's like really excited about what we just did together. And he's just kicking, 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 kicking my tennis shoe under the table like that, right? And so Bob says, wow, okay, let's do the next scene. We did it. And Bob went, okay, wow. And then they went ahead and did the deal. Um, well, when you, went in, and, when you went in for that audition, did you do something with your lip? I did. Uh, I stuffed my lip with a little tissue just to change the shape of my uh, lower uh, uh, gum. And, but it wasn't as big as it was in the movie. And so when, when I got to South Carolina, I asked Bob Z if he would be okay with me building up an apparatus or prosthetic that uh, would make my lip stick out. And he said, why do you want to do that? I said, because... I want the character to be unattractive on the outside, but beautiful on the inside. And he says, sure, go ahead. Wow. So uh, the office set me up with a dentist that could do the work in South Carolina, in Beaufort, South Carolina. And the guy built it for me. I went in for the fitting because I went two weeks before we started production. I like to get to location early and start honing in. And uh, Bob Z was cool with that as long as I stayed in a, really cheap motel that didn't really affect the budget. So I stayed at a really tiny little place for two weeks before they moved me to a nicer place um, with the rest of the cast when people started coming in. But I built the piece, and then Bob said he had second thoughts about it. He said, you know what? I really don't know about that. I don't think we should wear that piece uh, in your lip. He's like, I just, I said, no. He said, no, I don't want to offend black people. So I said, well, I'm black. I'm not offended. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so Bob said, no, I don't know. Seriously, I, I just don't think we should do it. But I'd had the piece made. So we start shooting day one. The first scene we shot was on the bus mm -hmm. when Forrest gets on the bus. And so I tucked my lip in like this and started doing the scene. And so Bob wouldn't notice that I was wearing the piece. And it was one day I was turned we were about four days in and I was turned to the side and I must've just been relaxed and my lip was sticking out real far. And Bob said, Michael T, are you wearing that thing? I said, yeah. He said, I thought we weren't going to wear it. I said, well, we're not wearing it. I'm wearing it, Bob. <laughs> and he didn't laugh at all. Right. I thought it was pretty funny. So he went, he had turned to the camera guys and he says, has he been wearing this thing every day? They said, yeah, every day. He said, they said, you didn't notice? He said, no. I said, and he gave me this look like, so I was like, uh-oh. 
but he let it go. And that turned out to be one of the most definitive things that contributed to that character, um, uh, that historic character. And so, you know, we laughed about it later, but he just, after a while, he just, he, he felt that it was right and he knew I was right. And he gave me his full support and it was cool, man. You know, um, I just think Zemeckis, my experience with him was that was a very kind of trying moment. And there was another uh, instance where I almost got, uh, almost lost my life on Gump. I was, um, the scene with all the explosions, we rehearsed for about three or four hours in this field with all the different explosions that they had going on. And so you had to have the right timing so the explosions were right behind you as you passed. They were far enough behind you so it didn't hurt you. And the sound of that I was supposed to listen for sounded like and I was supposed to jump up and run. Now, Hex and Gary Sinisa right behind me, hiding, duck down. And I, when all the explosions started going off, you couldn't hear a in the midst of all that noise. And so I missed my cue and I was listening for it. I couldn't hear it. And then one of those guys yelled out, T! And I looked back and he said, Go! And I took off running. And explosions you when you see the movie you see things exploding in my face i got pretty jacked up during that take and zemeckis was so upset because he's one of the safest guys you could ever work with but he he let me have it and when he was done i listened and i said are you done and he said yeah i said man listen you gave me a cue that sounds like I couldn't hear that cue in the midst of all this exploding and stuff like that. So you gonna blame me full on? We got to split that responsibility, man. And I just like stood up for myself, and I was like, "You can send me home. When you if you kick me off the movie, I'll be fine, Bob." But that was just wrong. You can't put all that on me, man. That's not fair. And so I thought I was gonna go home. We had a little huddle, and I was like, "All right, I'm good." And then he came back, and uh, we had a meeting of the minds, and everything smoothed out. But um, I just think the cue didn't help because right. it was so quiet. Because, like I said, Bob Z is one of the smartest human beings you'll ever meet. He's one of the most caring. And he was just really upset that he damn near lost an actor or injured an actor on one of his movies. But it wasn't, it wasn't the kind of thing that it was loud enough when it was quiet that he Figured it would be a good cue, but in the midst of all hell breaking loose, man, it was uh, it was inaudible. It was daunting. And, uh, it was a daunting challenge, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, you know, I almost got hurt behind that one. But you know, everybody, nobody's perfect. You know? In a movie like Forrest Gump or, or any movie, when you you shoot out of sequence, of course, uh, you you can often start at the end and work your way back to the beginning. How does a character, how do you evolve a character in a case like that? How does, how does well, the character evolve toward a, 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 toward a scene? That, you know, early in the movie, you're probably finding a character, but how do you culminate it so quickly? And how does the character evolve in your well, mind? But the, the, the way that I've been taught to do it is you just, Define your character's arc from beginning to end. Um, I'm not an I'm not an advocate or proponent of scene study. It's okay if an actor goes and, and takes scene scene study once or so, but don't make a career of scene study because when when I'm directing, for example, I can tell an actor when they come in or when I'm acting with someone, I can tell that they give a scene a beginning, a middle, and an end. Sometimes a scene is just the beginning of something. And in the overall arc, it pays off later. So I don't want you to tell me and indicate what the end is going to be. It's just a setup to have the audience curious as to what's going to be coming, you know? And, um, and so uh, I make certain that there's a full character developed arc because a lot of times 
as a black actor, we're not given fully developed arcs. We're given a job, but it's to support the first lead. Mm -hmm. So as a supporting actor, you have to create your own windows, your own behavior and your own misbehavior in that journey so that your character is equally as interesting as the first lead's character. And so um, that's kind of my approach. Uh, my approach is like I live my life. It's uh, love, respect, power, and a flamethrower. Uh, I give everybody love. I give everybody respect. I give no one power, but I do expect you to walk in your own power and not ever try and and uh, uh, chip away at my internal power, right? If I have a run-in with somebody or situation, then I uh, have a little tiny flamethrower that I carry in my back pocket. And I can take it out and just like hit it once. You don't have to totally incinerate people. But sometimes people need to know that you do carry a flamethrower. Yeah. And then I go right back to love. So it's love, respect, power, and a flamethrower. That's the same way I define characters. What do they love? Do they feel loved? Do they love the wrong person, Brent? Then I go to respect. Do they respect themselves? Do they respect others? Are they respecting the wrong person? Da -da 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 -da. Love, respect, power. Are they a powerful person? Do they feel like someone's power is usurping theirs? Da -da -da. Do they go home and turn the flamethrower on their wife? What do they do? So that's, that's the way I develop characters. That's my own system for developing a character. It's love, respect, power, and a flamethrower. So that's kind of how I map out my journey for uh, for my characters. So it, interesting. How you made your debut in 1975 uh, in Starsky and Hutch. How did right. that love, how did that philosophy evolve from 75 and to when did you actually hone in on that exact philosophy? It, it I, I honed in on my philosophy. It, it became a personal philosophy after studying Stanislavski and the different Uta Hagen and all the different, I, I trained with Nina Foch when I was coming up. So it's all the different teachers would teach me their system, but what evolved, Glenn Turman was another one of my teachers. Right. Roscoe Lee Brown was right. a teacher. Uh, Cleavon Little was one of my teachers. So Moses Gunn, the late Moses Gunn. So Based on what everybody taught me, including this, this gentleman named Jabuzi Bojingos, who used a conga drum to teach me acting, uh, I learned, I developed this system. So in 75, when you first saw me, I was using everybody else's system that I had been taught by up until that point, mm -hmm. you know, Dr. Frank X Ford and so on. And then um, uh, as time went on, I was like, it's got to be more simple than this. And then I realized Stanislavski wasn't, his life's work wasn't really done. His life ended, but his work was not done. He was still evolving as an artist, as an actor, mm -hmm. uh, just like me. So I continued to evolve and try to simplify my system. And it's just like through life experiences, you, you, you kind of devise your own system. And mine is love, respect, power, and a flamethrower. Wow, that's great. Who have you worked with? I mean, you worked with a lot of people. You worked with Denzel on Fences. You worked with Timothy Oliphant on Justified. Have any of those actors influenced your your acting? Uh, I would say they motivated my acting. Yeah. Um, as a black actor in Hollywood coming up, we... We knew that if there was going to be, there's this uh, saying of there can only be one. Mm -hmm. There can only be one black leading man. There can only be one black funny man, like really funny, like that's the guy. And it's like the gatekeepers in Hollywood, we, what we garnered from the way this, the industry was being run is that there can only be one. And so, when Denzel became that really powerful, amazing young leading man, I realized early on, because I used to see Denzel at auditions all the time. Mm -hmm. He would come down. I remember this one time uh, we were at a network for the final network callback. 
And I get off the elevator and it goes ding. And then I look down the hallway. When I turn the hallway and Denzel's looking and he said, I knew it was you, right? And we <laughs> fell out laughing because it was down to the final two guys. It was uh-huh. he and I. And, and D was a little older, had a little more experience than me. And he had a much better team representing him than I had. And he was ready. And so Denzel went on his path and I immediately realized, you know what? Since these gatekeepers are only going to allow one of us to be a leading man, let me be the most amazing character actor in history. And that's what I began to pursue. And that's why my work, all the characters seem to be different from one another because I take a lot of pride in just differentiating the humanity of each person, you know? Wow, that's a that's a really clarifying point. That's interesting. I had never heard that before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but guys like Tim Oliphant, Walton Goggins, Samuel L. Jackson, uh, Denzel, uh, Delroy Lindo. Um, man, the, the, there's an, an actor, uh, Richard Reilly, a character actor who's just phenomenal. Yep. Uh, Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland. Jackie Gleason was an influence for me. Um, I always thought he was just amazing, and uh, I wished I could have worked with him. But those guys inspire me more because I see that they're good guys and they made it through the gate. Mm -hmm. So it motivates me to continue my journey because success is really not, as they say, a destination. It's a, it's a journey. Yeah. That reminds me of one time when I was doing head of the class, I was walking down. Our office was off the, was off the lot across the street from the lot. And one day, one day Bill Schilling who played the principal said, Frankie, you know what the longest walk you'll make, you'll ever make in your career? And I said, what's that, Bill? And he said, from this side of the street to the other side of the street. <laughs> because the other side of the street was the entrance to Warner Brothers. And wow. that, that, that would be the longest walk I'd ever make in my career. Fortunately, wow. I, I had made that walk and I'm still making that walk. But like you, <laughs> like you, uh, you've been a remarkable, enduring actor. I mean, yeah. Just, just remarkable. And now you're directing. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I, mean, I, I have to, first of all, thank God. Uh, I'm a person of faith. Um, I believe in, in, in a lot of the principles I see in like in Proverbs. Uh, in fact, I embrace those principles. Um, I, I try to make my life mean more to people who are, who have a need than I'm not the guy that will pull up in a Rolls Royce. If I'm the pastor of a church, I wouldn't pull up in a Rolls Royce unless my congregation could all drive Mercedes Benzes. I'm just not that dude. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't believe in shining in other people's faces like that. But uh, I just try to be the best version of me I can be, man, as imperfect as I am. And I'm flawed, you know, uh, like everybody else on the planet. But I just try try to make my life mean something to others around me and then, you know, um, just try to add value to other people's lives. And how's that reflected in your directing? Uh, it really helps me, uh, to collaborate because I'm a very collaborative person. Uh, the director who makes a film by themselves, when you watch their movie, it looks like, you know, um, but truthfully, this is the highest form of collaborative art on the planet. Mm -hmm is filmmaking Mm -hmm. and, and the, uh, um, sorry, something just flashed on my screen after, after 10 to, uh, shortly, but, um, it's the highest form of collaborative art uh, in the world. And it's always better when you collaborate. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, as an actor, um, I understand how to, talk to actors and how to communicate to actors, how much to tell actors, what to tell actors to keep them motivated. And when not to tell actors anything. And, and then yeah, when not to, when to separate my actors, I'm not the kind of director that yells out that I want an actor to do something. And there's reasons for that. You know, um, the actor's instrument is a very personal instrument. It's so personal. In fact, that a lot of actors, consider the character them 
And so as an actor who does character work, because I don't really want to represent me, um, I know how to talk to other actors and keep their work and choices private. Plus, if I go up to an actor, I've had directors yell out stuff to me that is as corny as it can be. And you go, what? Inside, you go, what is this dude talking about? Did he not read the script? What's wrong with this dude, right? Is he not watching the show? So uh, I learned years ago that don't get into a conflict with a director. Just do the scene the way, if you're a series regular on the show, just do the scene. If it doesn't make sense and it violates your character and the writer supports you, that's there all the time with you and this guest director comes in, just do the scene the best way you know how. And if the director comes up and go, yeah, this time I want you to, not, I've been known to go, oh, yeah, 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 my bad, my bad, my bad, let's go again. Because they can only shoot it so damn much anyway. Because they got to make their day. So if a director can't be trusted, that's kind of my system, is to just be the dumb actor. Mm -hmm. You know, because this dude's only here for two weeks anyway, and he'll be gone. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he's not going to come in here and make me mess up the show and make so the character no longer tracks because he's got some brilliant idea. Um, that particular director I'm thinking about, for example, asked me to do something. And when the producers, he complained to me to the producers, and they asked him where he got the idea from. Because I said, it doesn't make sense. They said, no, we agree. I said, I don't even know where that, why he would make such a suggestion. He doesn't watch the show or what. And so they went and asked him. And he said his girlfriend oh had a dream that my character did that. Wow. So he was trying to get points with his girlfriend. It had nothing to do with the work at all. He caused all that trouble, like bad-mouthing me to the producers and stuff. But, you know, this is just an example of how you got to trust the people around you on a series that you've been flowing with for months. And then when a newbie comes in and tries to, change it all up if it doesn't track for you you gotta stand your ground that's all but respectfully you don't have to be mean just you can use my trick as the just this dumb actor you know what i mean aside from forrest gump uh what yeah. is a, what are some of your mo more favorite uh, more favorite roles that you've played outside of the ones we've already talked about well i, I did a project with uh, written by brad merman um, starring Kiefer Sutherland, uh, Kevin Pollock, uh, Grace Phillips, uh, and, and, you know, Martin Sheen came and did a cameo for us, but it was called Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. The director was Kiefer Sutherland. And I think Kiefer is a phenomenal, not just human being, but director as well. Uh, Kiefer was the first person in my career who gave me his word when I met him and we talked about what I was willing to do and not do and what I needed to be paid. He was the first person who ever kept his word a hundred percent. Since then, you know, I've worked with Denzel who keeps his word and Denzel makes things. If he tells you something, it's gold. You know, John Avnet, if he tells you something, it's gold. Michael Mann, if he tells you something, it's gold. Um, but, Truth of Consequences in New Mexico is one of my favorites. Heat with Michael Mann is definitely one of my favorites. That's one, um, of, my, one of my favorites, too. Man, what a dude, man. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Michael Mann is a machine. He's, yep. he's you know, uh, I've worked with the great Mike Nichols, who was phenomenal. Uh, God rest his soul. And um, uh, early on, I worked with a director named Stan Lathan. Mm -hmm. When I was a teenager, sure. And Stan, Stan helped me, had my back. We and we're still tight to this day, you know. Huh. What was Three Kings like? It was, it was crazy. <laughs> the fight, the, you know, that's the film where George Clooney and David O. Russell got into a fight, a physical altercation. David and, O. Russell uh, was the director. I, yeah, and. I was sitting on a helicopter. I was not in this angle of the scene. So I was sitting with another actor who's phenomenal named Holt McCallany. And Holt and I 
were sitting on the helicopter. George's assistant was a guy named Waldo. Waldo had taken the golf cart because we wanted to go get something for craft service, but Waldo took it around the other side of the mountain to go to craft service. So I'm looking and watching what they're doing, and then I just took off running toward the set. And by the time I got there, George and David O. Russell were head to head like two rams in the dirt, kicking up dirt. And I I grabbed David O. Russell and picked him up and walked him away. And he was headbutting me like this, like trying to make me put him down. And I so I squeezed him real hard. I said, David, it's Michael T. Come on, man. And he chilled out. And uh, knew that nobody was attacking him from behind because I caught him by surprise. And then Holt McCallany grabbed George and separated them. Now, David O is a gentleman. I don't know what got him so steamed that day, but this is the kind of guy he is. He offered George a beer and publicly apologized to George in front of the whole company. He didn't pull George aside and do some little cowardly apology. He apologized publicly like a man and offered George a beer. It still took a few years for them to bring their uh, uh, friendship full circle, and they're tight now. But uh, then then I read in the trades that Waldo broke up the fight. I'm like, Waldo's fat ass was at crap service on the other side <laughs> of the <ground." laughs> I was like, come on, man. Wow. Dude. Yeah, but people people steal your thunder. I mean, I wasn't going to tell anybody I did it, but Dan Waldo taking my credit. I'm like, what's wrong with you, man? You imagine. That's funny. Yeah. Craft sir. Who else was in that movie? Ice Cube? Yeah, Ice Cube, Mark Wahlberg, and, uh, you know, uh, I just love Mark. I, I, I worked with Donnie and loved Donnie, but I knew Mark first. And I just think Mark's got something. He's just, he's... The whole family's talented, you know, but Mark's Mark's just got something. And their mom, God rest her soul, she was a phenomenal mother. She was like the perfect mom for all those boys. Uh It was really something just to watch her operate and how much they love their mother. Man, they do anything on the planet, in the universe, in the galaxy for their mom. She was something special, man. She really was. That that brings me back, you know, the thought of the Wahlbergs. They have opened up a restaurant called Wahlburgers, of course. Right. That brings me right. back to a question I wanted to ask you that I forgot to. What do you think about every time you see Bubba Gum Shrimp? Oh, boy. I, I've never eaten there, never eaten there in my life. Um, I, I remember when the first one opened in... Honolulu, and I received this uh, letter in the mail. They wanted to fly us over in Learjet and take us to dinner and have a big grand opening and stuff. So I, I wrote them back and said, what about some stock? You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I never heard from them cats again, man. So I've never been to wow. one. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, I just have no no... I don't make any money from it. They're still kind of pimping my image and my likeness. Um, someone sent me a greeting card, a Hallmark card that had my voice in it. Whoa. You open it up and it's doing the whole shrimping routine. And I'm like, man, what? how do you just exploit well, they- young talent that doesn't have representation well like that? How do you, how do you, what kind of human yeah. being does that? They probably had to make a, a licensing deal with the production company. Yeah. And the production company owns a character. So right. that's how they ace you out of that. It's, it's, another, yeah, yeah. it's another way that the production companies make money off your acting. Wow. <laughs> that's terrible. It is terrible. It is terrible. Yeah. yeah, it sucks. And that's why I've never been to one of those places. You know? I got a question. Yeah, I, just, I got, well, go first ahead. of all, um, that's sad. I, I wish you were getting a piece of that because that would be a nice piece, I'm sure. Um, so the assistant that put you on tape, yeah, do they exist? Are they are they now a an actual you know like a legitimate person in the industry? Do you know? 
Well, Ellen Ellen Lewis was the head casting person, but she wasn't the one who saw me and put me on tape. I, of course, I had to get past her, right? And then passed on to Bob Z. But uh, it was a casting assistant who, hopefully, if that's what their passion was, hopefully that person. Uh, she didn't know my name, so I, I still don't know her name. <laughs> but um, you know, hopefully, she was able to turn that thing around. But it was a casting assistant that really helped me and hooked me up. Yeah, that's crazy. Told it, we, we, we promoted the fact that when Billy comes oh, in, sorry. They, they would make a lot of noise. So here, Hold he, on one second. here he is. Back to the, for the wilderness. Yeah. We got to. We got to. Okay, hold, hold on tight. We're going to get Billy in okay. here. Okay. How was the traffic? <laughs> I left it. Late. So, sorry guys. Michael T. Here's my my partner. Hey, Michael, how are you? Pleasure to know you, brother. How are you? Nice to meet you. My, nice to meet you. Re retired man. New York City Fire hey. Department member, first responder, Vietnam veteran, uh, a, a true admirer of yeah. Gary Sinise. Uh, <laughs> oh, he's, Billy, you got to tighten your chair. He does a lot for us, man. Gary Sinise. He does a lot for the fire department. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he's thank you really for good. your service. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Uh, really interesting character, man. I was uh, uh, doing some research on you. I was blown away how many great movies you've been in. Really, the, and the, they talk about all they talk about is how consistent that you're always working, always in action. That's a nice well, thing. That's, that's, a, that's a team effort, man. It's uh, you know, I, I started talking earlier about my faith walk. But then you have to have the right team players, people that believe in you too, yeah. uh, because nobody builds it by themselves, you know? You got to forgive me because I wasn't here for the beginning of the interview. I don't know how long you guys have been going. How long you guys been going? So 45 far? minutes or so. Have you been going 45 minutes? Yeah. So, so uh, nice to see you, Michael. Have a nice. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great well, I can you. Hear him yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, why don't you. Well, I was just curious. I mean, there was so many things you've worked in, uh, so many great movies you've worked in with so many great people. I mean, I, I was blown away for the, for all the people you worked with. Who was the most influential on you uh, that you do, of all the people that you've been exposed to or worked with? Who was the most helpful? As I'll say that, not influential, but most helpful as an actor. You know. uh, probably. Well, I learned from a bunch of different folks. Like Roscoe Lee Brown taught me things. Uh, Moses Gunn. Uh -huh. Taught me things. Um, George C. Scott <laughs> yeah. and I became became really tight when we worked together after Twelve Angry Men. And there's some secrets that George gave me that will uh, continue to give me the advantage in scenes all the time now. You know, um, but it, there's a bunch of folks that have influenced and motivated me. Twelve Angry Men is one of my favorite movies of all times. Uh, you guys did the, re the remake on it, the original one with Henry Fonda and everything. Still great, great film. You think they can do that stuff now? I mean, they can make a movie like that. I mean, obviously you made the remake, but it wouldn't go international. Would it, would they put 12 people in one room? You know, there's no special effects, no craziness, no machines and all that, you know? We'll, we'll, we'll have the tough time making a movie like that, I would think, nowadays, money-wise. Yeah, I mean, we shot that movie in 10 days. <clears throat> And um, it can be it can be done. I think a film like Twelve Angry Men can be timeless because it adapts to the times. For example, we've got a different relationship with China and with different parts of North Africa, you know, uh, aka the Middle East. So if you've got people from different hotbeds and regions around the world, and twelve of those folks are in a room together, they're going to have different opinions. And there can be a lot of conflict in that room. And so I, I think it could an idea like that could work today as well. Yeah, well, I, I thought it was really, I mean, it was one of my favorite movies when I was a kid. I thought it was great. You know, speaking of 12 Angry Men, uh, as a director, do you look at everything as a director when you're acting in it? Because 12 Angry Men, there would be so much coverage of 12 people around a room. And I, I think you do it, in 10 days, it was a remarkable thing to me because you only have one location, but still there was so much coverage. One of the hardest things to shoot is shooting around the table. Uh, how, did, how did your director's mind work in that scenario? Well, it, it, you're absolutely right. 
it's uh, shooting around a table is uh, extremely challenging. Is that because of the confinement, but, guys? I'm sorry, let me interrupt you. Is it because of the confinement of it all? Yeah, because you you want you want to create some kind of movement. So, uh, but Billy Friedkin, you know, God rest his soul, was our director. Wow. And Billy Billy knew how to get movement in there so that the audience wouldn't get tired of being seated all the time and right. just a bunch of talking heads. So he knew how to do it, uh, how to uh, put the camera on certain things as a close up. So you get different kinds of information, you know, why is this important? How does this pay off? But that was mapped by mapped out by Billy Friedkin. Uh, he's one of the greats for sure. It, oh. takes, it takes a lot of preparation to do a, 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 a movie like 12 angry men because you got to get individual coverage on 12 different people who are often talking at the same time or right. you know, not overlapping, but talking. One person can be talking here at this end of the table, and then you got to go up and get his coverage at the other end of the table. That can be pretty, right. ca- pretty time consuming. It's got to be tough stuff. Yeah. Yep. Well, for our audience, I'm freaking the director, the exorcist. I mean, obviously his credentials are pretty damn good. Uh, hell of a director. And I, by the way, I loved you in fences, man. I thought that was a great, great job. And that's one of my, favorite place too when i read it um, you guys thank you that's thank you that's the power of ensemble and it's also um uh denzel viola stephen mckinley henderson russell hornsby and i had done the play on broadway together uh with denzel we'd all done it together and so when it was and we, when we were making the we were on broadway for 16 weeks we uh you knew there was a 16 week limited run and we were actually fleshing it out for the movie. So we get to the movie, uh, the movie's being cast and Denzel gets sent this list of actors that they want to surround he and Viola with. And Denzel was like, what are you doing? No. What about the cast that, what about Michael T and Steven and Russell? What about those guys? And so the, and so the, the, the studio said, well, we want to surround you with, like, who's hot right now and stuff. Denzel said, nah, I, these guys are hot right now. And so Denzel forced them to come to us. And so they came to us with this really low-ball offer that wasn't even a week's pay for multiple weeks, a take-it-or-leave-it offer. So a couple of us reached out to Denzel and let him know why we weren't signing and hadn't done the deal and so uh denzel got to the bottom of it and i think he put money back into the production and made sure that we got our money and when everybody was good to go um we did the movie but that's just kind of the that's the kind of human being denzel is even when the studios like trying to manipulate and play games uh he's an actor who sticks with the other actors Good to hear. Fordham University guy. Yeah. Mount Vernon. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Fordham, Mount right? Vernon. Yeah, that's right. Went, came from Mount Vernon, but then uh, went to school in Mount Fordham University, which is about three that's miles right. from my local pub. <laughs> 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 Where I used to hang out. There's most of my damage. What do you think? Uh, uh, I mean, I always thought that Fences, uh, it's such a great play. I always thought that it was basically that regardless of what happens, your parents tried whatever good intentions they have are going to screw you up one way or another. <laughs> like, no matter how good your intentions are as a parent, you're going to screw up your kids one way or another. Did you get that kind of? Yeah. Uh, having parents and, and being a parent, I, I can, I can attest to the fact that there is a lot of credibility to the statement of there are no perfect parents. Um, but you know, as long as you put love on it, I think it. I think it. It comes full circle. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I think your kids come back to you, even if it's not great. I think some parents uh, coddle their children so much that that's bad parenting too. You know, yeah. because the kids don't want to do a damn thing unless it's handed to them. So there's different levels of mistakes in parenting, and. Um, I think every parent can attest to that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I definitely... You can. <laughs> <laughs> you can. <laughs> what gets me is when you're a parent and you always say, I'm not going to say make the same mistakes my, my parents made with me, you know, which is impossible because you either overreact the other way or, you know, 
one way or another, you're going to make a mess of things. You can always count on that. Right. Uh, uh, since we've talked to you, I'm going to bow out of this. I probably have for the last five, 10 minutes, but why don't you ask Michael T anything you want to ask him? And I'll tell you whether we've gone over it before. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I did. Uh, you told me George C. Scott was very influential. I mean, a, and a really nice guy, a generous guy, with his uh, yeah. with, with his help. But I mean, I some of the guys you worked with blow me away. Hume Cronin. I mean, I, I I'm a big Hume Cronin fan from way back. You know, uh, just uh, was there anybody you, you felt intimidated with when you were acting with? Because I mean, you've been in the game for a long time. I mean, since you were what 18, 21? Yeah, uh, I was the nine when I first started. Wow. But um, but as far as intimidation, I, I really didn't allow anybody to intimidate me. Uh huh. Um, my my stepdad taught hand to hand combat for the Air Force, <laughs> and my my brother ended up teaching hand to hand combat in the, in the army, and um, so we came up scrappy, you know. Um, I used to. For sport, we just box in the middle of the street everywhere I grew up as an as an Air Force kid moving around. Yeah. And for me, it was a really fast way to make friends was to show the kids some of the martial arts and stuff that I knew. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, my dad would never tolerate me being intimidated. I was intimidated by a bully one time who made me a kid named Rodney King. And this kid... Uh, was threatening me with a small knife in elementary school and making me bring my mom's jewelry to school or he was going to kill me, right? Mm -hmm. And so my mom finally cornered me and said, why, am I, why is my jewelry disappearing? So I finally had to confess. Turns out this kid's dad was a sheriff or a cop in L.A. And he's the biggest bully. So after that, my, my dad stepped it up and made sure I could handle anybody, you know, that would come at me that if, as long as they weren't like really big over me. So that kind of applied to my, to my, uh, uh desire to make sure nobody ever intimidated me. I was also abused as a kid when my mom and dad divorced. Um, uh, uh someone, my family trusted, my mom trusted, took advantage of me when I was a kid wow. and then threatened to hurt my mom if I said anything. So by the time I started acting, man, I, I was not playing you had, around. You had, a pretty thick, yeah. you had a pretty thick skin by the time you started yeah, acting yeah. anyway. Yeah, absolutely, man. So, uh, but I saw someone on 12 Angry Men, George C. Scott, Jack Lemon, Gene Cronin. Keep those three men in mind. George C. would look across the table at Jack Lemon when Jack was doing his his spiel and Jack would lose his lines. And so Jack would say, stop it, George. And George would say, I'm not doing anything to you. Learn your shit, Jack. Like everybody. <laughs> <else."> <laughs> <laughs> and so Courtney Vance and, uh, uh, Gandolfini, Jimmy, and, and I would look at each other like, and then Hume would go, stop it, George. George, I'm not doing anything to him. Just looking at it. And he would go, stop it, boys. Stop it right now. And But Jack Lemon, if George C. Scott looked at him, Jack would forget everything. Wow. So George would just have to turn away and just pretend he wasn't looking at him and just kind of glance back. But I'm telling you, man, I never, as great as Jack Lemon is, I never thought anybody could intimidate Jack Lemon. And I saw George C. Scott do it every day in rehearsal. And even during the 10 days of shooting. And it just blew my mind. That blows my mind. You're an old pro, yeah. Jack Lemon. You know, I mean, worked with Cagney. Right. Worked with Cagney, for Christ's sake. You know, and that's right. Intimidated by yeah. Scott. Yeah. Jack, Lemon, yeah. Jack Lemon said a great thing about acting. They asked him, he's, he's worked for, they, they said, you worked for 40 years. How have you been so successful? And he said, well, I'll tell you what. In 40 years, I've done about 30 movies. Each of the, each of those movies have taken about six months of my time. So I've really been out of work for 20 out of those 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that your hobbies, <laughs> hobbies kind of, 
classic cars I can understand as a hobby. Yeah. How the hell has rodeo, yeah. rodeoing become a hobby? I would think that'd be a full-time gig. You guys covered that? Well, we sort of covered it, but one of the, we, we sort How of- does that become a part-time gig? I mean, I figure you're either all... It's like it's like saying I'm a part-time heroin addict. You know, I just do it when I feel like it. You know what? <laughs> rodeoing, I would think, is a full-time commitment, you know? Yeah, it's no, it's a it's a passion. <laughs> and I'm I'm not I'm not at at almost six three, I'm really not one of, I'm too big to be a bull rider, you know, or 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 a bronc rider. But um the sport that I I, I still wrestled for a little while and just still realized wrestled. it was Yeah, I just realized it was too dangerous for me. Uh, I didn't want to lose an eye getting a, a horn turned toward my face or anything like that because I work as an actor. So I uh, there's a couple of other actors that are real cowboys. It's Glenn Turman mm-hmm. and another gentleman named Reginald T. Dorsey and uh, another uh, guy named Oba Babatunde. So Glenn, Reginald, and I, uh, I had the privilege of being on a team with them, team pinning for the Bill Pickett Rodeo. And if you know what team pinning is, you're on horseback. There's three of you on horseback. The the ref will raise a flag with a number on it, and you have to go flesh out from a herd of cattle. You got to find the cattle with that number painted on its backside, and you got to flush those into a pen, and you have to do it in record time. And so that was the sport that I gravitated toward is team pinning. So that's why it's a hobby. It's not something I do. It doesn't pay enough money for me to do it full time. But um, it, it, I make a, I, mean, I make a much better living as an actor and a director. It probably but, uh, it probably helped you get your most recent movie with Neil, though. Well, yeah, but it, that's also a relationship with Neil. Yep. it's a relationship with John Abnett. Guys who know that I'm a horseman. Like even now, one day a week, I'm out on a buddy's ranch. At least one day a week, uh, fixing fences like. This Wednesday, I was out fixing fences and, and grooming horses, and a friend of mine is teaching me shoeing right now. Wow. So, wow. you know, yeah. Uh, so it, it, I, I just love the cowboy lifestyle. I think it's very cool. Is, is that because your father being a staff sergeant in the Air Force, did you grow up around Oklahoma or Texas or something? Where did this love come from? Uh, well, just from uh, as a kid, I worked. In uh, at a stable called El Fig Stables in Gardena, California. Um, it was uh, on on Figueroa Street, El Segundo and Figueroa, which is now all industrial. There's a very few small stables, but that was all open land and fields and oil wells. And we used to ride horses there. And I would go there after school and scoop and feed so that I could ride on the free. weekends for free. Yeah. yeah. So that's why that's why I picked it up. My love of horses, just watching cowboys, you know, um, and wanting to be a cowboy. Wow! Uh, I know Michael T's got a heart out, so I'm going to ask uh, Derek and Billy if you got any final questions. Yeah, I got a, I got one more. I got two more questions. So you're an avid uh, art collector. Who's your favorite artist? Um, there's a uh, an artist. Well, I think Picasso is just off the chain. Wow. Uh, Basquiat, but there's a, there's an artist named uh, Nashime Lindo. She's Delroy Lindo's wife. Oh. So, Nashime Lindo. Okay. And uh, there's an artist out of Texas. His name is Frank Frazier. So, I have some Frank Frazier's and I have some Lindo's in my collection. And uh, I think those are probably my most cherished uh, uh, pieces of art. Are you familiar with uh, Theaster Gates? No. Out of Chicago? should check him out. No. Okay, I will. Um, yeah. Also, what's your favorite, you're, you're a vintage car collector. What's your favorite uh, card that you have in your collection? Well, right now, I'm down to just, uh, just a couple of cars. My favorite is, uh, I've got a 53 Chevy truck. Okay. Uh, I call her girlfriend. <laughs> uh, let me see. <laughs> so, if, if, if you call my house and my wife is out, say he's out with girlfriend, with his girlfriend, that's what she's talking about. Oh, uh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, it's the only girlfriend she'll allow me to have and that I actually have the energy for. Um, <laughs> Would you mind sending me a picture of that? I'll put it up. Yeah, I'll show it to you right here. Okay. Uh, hang on a second. And I'll send Frank a picture. Okay. 
Oh yeah. Uh, oh wow. Okay, so that's you can take that to the rodeo. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> no man. <laughs> no. I don't want. Listen, I've got cowboy hats that are too fancy to wear around horses, man. Are you kidding me? I bet. I bet. <laughs> what you got, Bill? Yeah. Oh well, just. Sorry, I missed the first part of this interview, man, because I was just blown away by the by the body of work that you put together. So, congratulations on that. And, uh, really, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming to work. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 if you think the rodeo page, man, you are. <laughs> 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 you gotta be the check, right, right? You gotta check the seats and check the seats. Yeah, <laughs> I'll jump off a horse on a bloody steer. We'll see what happens. Uh, that's pretty funny. Can you see me wrestling the steer to the ground, Frank? No, you know, no, well, no, I can see you. We got a lot, of cattle, a lot of cattle Stop in the Bronx. Yes. A lot of cattle yeah. in the Bronx. Well, in closing, Michael, thank you so much for being a part of us. I would be remiss if I didn't say Jeff McCracken said to say hello. He was oh, one, give Jeff my love. One of our Bay City Bluebirds, as were you. Uh, and uh, congratulations on a great career. And we haven't seen the end of Michael T. Williamson, that's for sure. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you my appreciate friend. Appreciate All right, man. Appreciate it. Thank All you, right. Man. You got it. Okay. Yeah, terrific guy, man. I'm sorry I missed the big first part of that because uh, I, I was blown away when I was just looking at the body of work the guy did. It's incredible. I mean, uh, the people he's worked with. And that's a hell of a story about George C. Scott intimidating Jack Lemmon. I didn't think anybody could intimidate Jack Lemmon. Or, or, so we all, we all years, have our insecurities. <laughs> no matter how many years in the business, we already you never have know. It. it could still pop in there. Right? It's still. I think that's a good question, actually. What are your insecurities, Frank? My insecurity? <laughs> How much time you got? Yeah. <laughs> the same as Billy's. I like, How much time you got? I like his answer. I like his answer. The same as Billy's. I like his answer. My insecurities? My Me? insecurities. Insecure? What? You got an hour and a half? <laughs> Can I lie down when I'm telling you this stuff? Because I always like to lie down when I'm giving the therapist, you know? Well, Billy, I appreciate the fact you're on the freeway for, for you know, you know, how, how many hours? Two hours? I think we got on there. We, we, I picked up Jenny at a quarter to eight and I uh, hit, the, I guess, the freeway about eight o'clock. From eight o'clock till 10 o'clock, it was no go. Wow. wow. Nova. Nova. Yeah. Nova. Huh? Nova. Speaking of go, we got to go. We got to go. So uh, see you next week. See you next week. And uh, you got the blessings of not having my miserable face on camera for a bit. <laughs> So if you tuned in, I hope you had a good time. Thanks for looking in. Always appreciate it.